UFC 285 just recently went down. It was an epic card with John Jones becoming the heavyweight champion and making history in the main event. He was also my lock of the week, so you guys know I'm super happy about it. I'm going to talk about each of the matchups on the card. Make sure you smash that like button if you're new to the channel. Subscribe. And let's start it off with the first fight of the night. Esteban Rebovic takes on Loic Radzabov. Listen, Rebovic gave a gutsy effort but the takedowns of Radzabov are what won him the fight. Granted, there was moments where Rebovic had Radzabov hurt, but takedown secured, get him a decision. The favorite status was stupid. You see, minus 550 for Radzabov. He was not that large of a favorite. Rebovic was right there. He gave a great fight. And 11-1 and with a lot of potential, still at only 26. And he fought a guy in Loic who has championship experience in the PFL. At a high level, those guys over there, it's a no-joke tournament. you got to be active all the time. Loic's a good fighter. And Rebovic's having big moments, even taking a round in that fight, is massive. Still, Radzibov gets it done, finishes the fight on top, gets a win. That's how it starts off early. Next fight on the card, it was Farid Basharat and Damon Blackshear. I wasn't overly impressed with Basharat. Yeah, he was able to do fairly well against Blackshear, but I remember Blackshear having him in a bad spot on the floor and nearly having his back. I think that Farid Basharat's got skills. He's you know, a pretty proficient kickboxer, decent with the grappling, uh, but nothing was crazy impressive. He clearly won against Damon Blackshear, but not like the performance of a lifetime where I'm like, yo, that's the next guy. He's only 25, though, so he does have a lot of time to marinate and get better. I think there is you know, a bright future for him. Uh, with a Demont Blackshear win that's solid. I just wasn't like overly wowed by the performance. But good win for Farid Basharat. I want to keep running up the card. Next matchup, Tabitha Ritchie, Jessica Penne. This was a showcase. Ritchie bullied Jessica Penne from the start of this fight. And then she arm bars her. Yeah, Tabitha Ritchie's a problem. I think she has a pretty interesting future in this sport. She's not even 30 yet. 8-1. and one. At 115, with her grappling skills and, I think, develop in striking, she's a problem. She does really well at putting opponents on their butt, and then they kind of just choose to stay on the ground, and she just kicks the fuck out of their legs. So, good win for Tabitha Ritchie. Locks up an armbar. She looked dominant on top. Bully Jessica Penne. The win went the way of Ritchie, and I do really feel like she's got a lot of potential to be something big for Brazil here. She's also got the looks, too. Doesn't hurt. Next fight, Cameron Simon, Mano Martinez, a fight that was plagued by fouls. Simon with two nut shots, nearly blinds Mano Martinez as well in the third round. He gets the win. He deserved the win. Mano Martinez gave a gutsy fight and, you know, threw hard shots. And, you know, he brought a fight to Cameron Simon, but Simon was on point. The problem is now we're looking at him as a guy who accumulates a lot of fucking fouls. And if the judges went the way, if all three of them said Mano Martinez won the first round, that's a 10-8 first because of the low shots. Simon's in a draw. Now, he gets it done, he gets the win, and even a judge, I believe, gave him a 10-8 second round. Simon looked really solid, and at 22, this South African kid is on the come up beating Mano Martinez, but I have to really praise Mano's toughness because he gave a fucking hard effort in the fight that he was just a little bit outgunned and also fouled. A few too many times you couldn't see at the end, and he still went through and fought. So respect to him. Cameron Simon, though, clear winner and great performance for the young dude. Next fight, Ian Machado, Gary, not without a bit of, I don't want to say controversy, but I guess some. Because Ian Gary got dropped by a hook. Keenan Song landed it, drops him. Ian Gary looked pretty much done, somehow survives, you know, to the end of the round, recovers in round two, and... Looks better than he did in the first round. He was on point. He was picking Keenan Song apart, beat the shit out of him, and eventually worked towards a stoppage win. I feel like Ian Gary's distance striking is really good. And offensively sound, and like he has a good fight IQ. He knows how to pick guys apart. But I worry about that chin because it got cracked. It was a good clean punch. But I don't think the biggest shot I've ever seen. And to nearly be out, like it looked like Ian wasn't going to bounce back from it. How did he stay in it? It's because Ian Gary's in tremendous shape. Not saying that he's getting ran over by mid-level guys, but getting dropped by a lower-level guy in Keenan Song, it shows he can come through adversity, yes, but it also shows you can get to him. 
There's still going to be a lot of improvements. He's only 25. He's a baby in the fight game. Good win over Keenan Song, and he gets to finish, which I'm very happy about him actually getting a stoppage here. Was worried we'd see him go long and get another decision again, which is not what I want for Ian Gary. Not what I think the UFC wants. You know, he's Irish. He's got the Conor McGregor flair. They're going to try to build him. He beats Keenan Song, and I think you got to just slowly work him up the rankings. But keep in mind, he is 25. Yeah, he's 11-0, and but he's only 25. He's so young. Good win, though. Ian Gary gets it done, but... Having to overcome some adversity. Next fight, Mark andre Burial, Julian Marquez. Okay, can we talk about this fight here? Okay. Julian Marquez is a one-round fighter. He doesn't have the gas tank. He was getting just pulverized in the second round against the cage by Burial in the clinch. But in the first round, he's throwing heavies. He's flurrying inside. He's quicker than Mark andre Burial, and he's touching him. But holy fuck, he gasses out. He has to keep such a high pace to be competitive, and then he just fades heavy. Marc-Andre Burial did what he needed to do, worked him against the cage. Mark has looked great in the first round, but fall off is hard after round one. Something to note um, if you're you know thinking about picking or playing Marquez in the future. That gas tank is a huge question mark now. He comes out high, and he wants to bang. Marc-Andre Burial brought the bang to him and fucking outbanged him. Pulls it off. Marc-Andre Burial, good win for Canada. Shout out to the Canadian. Next fight, it was Amanda Hibas and Viviani Arujo. Listen, Amanda Hibas, I think, put on a good performance. She got stunned up a little bit in the first round. But then Hibas showed that she can strike and she can grapple against the bigger girl in Arujo. And Hibas doesn't get tired. Arujo was fading in that third round. Amanda Hibas looked good. It was a really solid performance. I mean, I think... When you look at Amanda Hibas' skill set, she can contend with like a high level. I think right now you're putting her in the mix with top fighters. Like she seems very upper echelon to me. It was really good. Yeah, Amanda Hibas is a problem. I'm just trying to imagine her taking on, let's say, a Valentina Shevchenko. I mean, she's got dangerous jujitsu. We saw what happened to Valentina in the main. She's dangerous at 125. I'm very excited for Amanda Hibas. For Viviani Arujo, she's in no woman's land with, you know, being 36 and on a losing streak. Her days of being talked about as a contender are done. Amanda Hibas, only 29. She's coming into her prime. Striking's developing, getting more comfortable there. Ground game is always good. I like what I'm seeing from Amanda Hibas. And she's got a good fight coming up next. A big fight coming up next. She wants a top five. I think you give it to her. Next fight on the card. Drikes Duplessis versus Derek Brunson. So, Derek Brunson is a monster in the first round. But he does not have the gas tank after it. He out-wrestled and controlled Drikes and had moments and was able to strike with him. But Drikas has got the fucking grit. He digs deeper. Derek Brunson fades, man. And Drikas Duplessis puts it on him with the striking, gets him out of there. I think that Derek Brunson, even though he was on his back for the way that fight ended, then the corner threw in the towel. Like, he was on his way to get knocked out. And the last shot that landed seemed like it put Brunson's brain just, you know, straight scramble mode. It's like hitting a fucking TV. It just scrambled. And thankfully, the corner threw in the towel. Duplessis, he's got holes, man. He could be taken down and controlled, but he won't ever quit. So that's an interesting guy at that top level. I wonder how he fights with a Sean Strickland, a more scrappy striker that's going to bring the heat to him and can grapple. I kind of like that Sean Strickland fight. I think that's dangerous for Drikas. But that could be the matchup to make next. We'll see. I'll drop the every fight to make, and you guys will find out. But I like Drikas Duplessis. A lot moving forward as far as, you know, being a South African prospect. But I think Robert Whitaker would take him out. I think these more technical kickboxers like an Adesanya, Cannoneer is a very hard fight. Him and Paulo Costa is a fun matchup. I could see him getting outgunned in that. That chin comes up high. He's finding shots on Derek Brunson. But Derek Brunson has just never fixed his striking flaws. As DC even said in the commentary, he still throws that left hand with the chin up. He does still throw that left hand with the chin up here. Drikas Duplessis did what needed to be done. 
He overcame an early storm. He weathered it, and he brought the heat to Derek Brunson, and he gets him out of there. And he continues his ascent up the rankings. 19-2 and two is a great record, and he's ranked now, but it ain't getting easier on the way up. Not at all. Next fight, Cody Garbrandt versus Trevin Jones. You know, Trevin Jones is the most low-output fighter in the UFC at this point. I don't know why he's not attacking. The dude has skills. He has power. Cody Garbrandt kind of slipped and moved on him for the first two rounds. And, you know, it seemed to be ahead. Trevin Jones didn't really do much. Landed maybe a couple punches. But in round number three, Trevin Jones landed massive hook. A massive hook. It was a two-punch call. A straight and hook, I believe. It was a massive shot that landed and had Cody Garbrandt moving away. And he, like, definitely was hurt from the shot. Trevin Jones doesn't follow up with strikes enough. He finishes the round looking for a takedown and sitting in the full guard of Cody Garbrandt. The fight IQ was non-existent for Trevin Jones. Now, Cody Garbrandt did look f- pretty solid, but he fought like extremely safe. Trevin Jones really wasn't throwing a lot. Cody wasn't engaging a lot either because he knew Jones was looking for the counters. So it turned out to be like a lull ass fight. Cody gets a win, but not super impressive for the former champ. I mean, yes, a win, which is good. But, like, you got to think you can't jump him right back into the ranked opposition. He's winning a lackluster decision against Trevin Jones and nearly getting dropped in the third round. Cody's best days are behind him. I said it before this fight. I'll say it again. Whether I was wrong or not thinking he would get chinned by Trevin Jones, yeah, I'm wrong on that front. But Cody Garbrin didn't look good, and you can't tell me he's back to form. He could have easily lost to a Trevin Jones that actually throws strikes. It didn't happen. It is what it is. Cody Garbrandt gets the win. He was quicker than Jones. He took him down a few times. The wrestling was on point. But Cody Garbrandt don't want to get hit, man. He's got the skills. He doesn't have the durability. Good win for Cody. No love. But Trevin Jones, very underwhelming as uh, a guy with the chance of a lifetime. I was very disappointed. Let's jump to the main card. If you guys haven't yet, make sure you smash the hell out of the like button. And let's talk about this fight. It's Bo Nickel versus Jamie Pickett. Okay, this one was kind of weird because Bo Nickel did kind of knee him in the groin as he went for that throw and then got on top of Jamie Pickett, which led to the finishing armbar sequence. I believe armbar. Let me fucking make sure. I'm like, armbar. What am I saying armbar? Arm triangle. Yeah, arm triangle. That's why I'm like, that doesn't sound right. Arm triangle, not armbar. Bo Nickel gets the armbar on Jamie Pickett. But it did look like Pickett got hit in the balls and he was trying to signal to the ref, yo, he hit me low. The ref didn't do anything about it. It is what it is. Bo Nickel would have probably won anyways. It is just disappointing having that as like a factor in my mind of him kneeing him in the balls. And, you know, Jamie Pickett did defend, you know, a takedown attempt once. We'll see what Bo does. I don't think you got to rush him. I think you got to take your time with building him. Let him fucking marinate. Just don't throw him in the oven of these savages just yet. Let's build them up. Let's give them some more fights against lesser guys. Not a top 25 like they were talking about on the UFC post-fight show. No. Give them like a top 40 guy again. Somebody just a little better than a Jamie Pickett. Don't jump him up the ranks too fast. I want to see him in another fight versus a guy that actually wants to try to take his head. Jamie Pickett was terrified getting inside of the cage. He looked nervous all week and he looked especially nervous when the fight actually started. I need somebody that's going to actually think he can win. Try to fight Bo Nickel. Give Bo a little bit of a challenge. Everybody so far is just getting slaughtered. Yeah, I think Bo's really good. But for his own benefit, he needs to be tested just a little bit. So we find out how he does with some resistance. Because right now we have no idea. Because Jamie Pickett got broken easily. Not shot or not. Clean win for Bo Nickel, they'll say. Because they didn't call it. It is what it is. That's the fucking fight game. Bo Nickel with the win. Good performance. Bright future. Bo Nickel, baby. All right, next one. It was Mataj Gamrod and Jalen Turner. Ends in a split decision. So Jalen Turner had good striking moments in the fight for sure. Mataj Gamrod has the takedowns in control. Little bit of damage too in the second round. Nice crucifix. In the third round, he finishes the fight getting on top. And then Jalen Turner trying to scramble back up to his feet. It was a really competitive fight, and Jalen Turner landed some damaging strikes. And if you're talking about overall more damaging strikes, Jalen Turner landed more of them. But if you're looking at strikes overall, including ground and pound from a crucifix position, which is tremendously dominant, that's good look for Mataj Gamrot. Also a very weird stand-up 
in the third round where Mataj Gamrot was against the cage on top of Turner and the ref decided to stand it up, which I didn't think was necessary. I thought that was an early stand-up. We'll say previously before that, Mataj Gamrot clearly dug his hands into the gloves to prevent Jalen Turner from trying to post and get back up to his feet. So, you know, kind of maybe like a punishment for that. Mataj wins. He beats Jalen Turner, who's got a lot of potential. But, like, I'm not over ready to say Mataj is coming for anything at the top of the weight class. I, I think him and Benil Dariush fight again. It's the same result. How does he do at the upper echelon? Like, I know he gave Armin Sarukin a tough fight. I feel like Mataj Gamrot, guys that lack the wrestling are going to get ran over. Jalen Turner was close, man. He's got to tighten up that wrestling a little bit and become a little more offensive of, off his back. But it's hard to do with one of these lifetime savage wrestlers like a Mataj Gamrot, who does a great job of fucking constantly wrestling, pinning you down, and controlling on top, and looking for finishes too. Mataj has just been in nasty, tough fights recently, which is why he hasn't gotten one. Listen, Jalen Turner, gutsy fucking effort, and I respect Jalen Turner a ton as he tried his ass off. But ultimately, Mataj Gamrot, the rightful winner, in my opinion, because of the takedown. But now I'm thinking of it, ah, I might argue with myself a little bit. I'm like having an internal monologue as I'm recording this right now because I'm thinking Jalen Turner does more damage. They say damage trumps all, but takedowns, top control, punches from the top, how you finish the fight sways it. The judging is never going to be perfect. People will be upset on either side. Mataj Gamrot gets the win, but you can see them scoring it his way. Jalen Turner did not finish that fight strong, whereas Mataj Gamrot did. And let's say it comes down to that third and final round, the make or break moment. Jalen Turner unfortunately fumbles it. Mataj Gamrot gets a very competitive, and I expect controversy around it, win over Jalen Turner. Next fight on the card, it was the featured bout Shavkat Rachmanov versus Jeff Neal. Listen, Shavkat Rachmanov fought through some hell with Jeff because Jeff was throwing everything at him. They were banging. Jeff Neal put on a good performance even in a loss here. But Shavkat Rachmanov is a straight fucking killer. He was walking through fire because Jeff Neal was landing clean punches to his face. That would have put most guys down. Shavkat was hurting Neal bad in that third run after being hurt himself too. And then he strangles him with a standing rear naked choke, which is a rare move in MMA. Jeff Neal was just pulverized at this point. He looked like Apollo Creed in Rocky IV, but I listen, he was giving a better effort than Apollo did against Drago. I'll say that. Shavkat Rachmanov got tested tonight, and we found out he can fight through hell. After the fight, he says, give me Colby. Don't think he gets Colby. Don't hate that idea, but don't think he gets Colby. You know who I think they're going to give him? And I'll spoil this. It's Bilal Muhammad. Bilal doesn't have the huge name value where he's fighting the money fights like a Kobe Covington will be because probably Kobe fights the winner of Burns Masvidal. For Shavkat, quiet guy, doesn't speak a lick of English, they're going to throw Bilal to him. And let's see how that fight goes down. That's a really interesting matchup that I'd be very, very excited to see. Hopefully they don't try to get out of that fight and, you know, limit it because, I don't know, at one point... I know Shavka worked with uh, Habib's father, and then you know Habib recently was working with uh, Bilal. Hopefully there's not like, you know, brotherhood amongst them that it prevents them from fighting because we have to see what happens between those two in the cage. That is a very sensible fight to me. And I think Shavka has a good shot of stopping him on the feet. As far as wrestling goes, Shavka ain't no Hamzat Shemaev with his wrestling. He proved that in this fight. He struggled. He couldn't get Neil down. Jeff Neal's wrestling's A1, but good sub standing by Shavkat. Neal looked so good. They gave him his win bonus, which I was happy to hear because he gave everything in that cage. Great fight. Let's get to the next one, our co-main event, which saw Alexa Grasso dethrone Valentina Shevchenko. Yeah, Shevchenko dropped the fucking bag in this one. She was winning the fight, probably like up two rounds to one in that fourth round, and then spinning wheel kick. Grasso closes the gap, jumps on the back, and then rear naked choke. It was so fast. It was like this, and it was fully under. Shevchenko made that mistake of the spin, but she was clearly winning the fight. So you have to give her an immediate rematch. Now, I will say, in the first round, Grasso got to Shevchenko with her hands and touched her up beautifully. 
great win for Alexa Grasso. I'm happy she became the world champ. Obviously, it's been the lifelong dream of hers. I've been watching her in the UFC for so many years now. She took some losses. She continued to grind, come back, and now become world champion. Her beating Shevchenko was wild to me, though, because Shevchenko looked to be clearly the sharper fighter of the two. Doesn't always end that way. Valentina Shevchenko made one mistake. Grasso's extremely good and said after the fight, I was preparing for her to do that. I was ready for her to spin and then capitalize. So great win for Alexa Grasso. But hey, Valentina Shevchenko's coming and we got to run that one back. Let's jump to the main event. And if you guys haven't smashed the likes and if you're new, subscribe. John Jones versus Surreal Gone. It was the John Jones show. He absolutely murdered Cyril Ghan in this fight. I'm going to brag a little bit about the pick because I rode with John Jones when a ton of people were doubting me saying too much time off. He's not going to have it. I really thought his strength would be a factor at heavyweight. It was more of a factor than I even expected. He bullied Cyril Ghan. He got a hold of Cyril Ghan and threw him to the floor like he was a damn kid. Cyril Ghan finds a way back up. Jones takes him down again, secures a great position against the cage, works towards the guillotine, can't get it the first time. Then, Cyril Ghan, he lets him out, he like readjusts, and like John just perfectly locks it up. And quickly, Cyril Ghan's tapping. As far as the striking goes, you know what? I went back and rewatched the fight. John Jones' stand-up actually didn't look that slow. People, you know, were probably overthinking his, you know, kind of wide misses of shots, like when he missed that hook and he was a little off balance, but he recovered back to his feet quickly. And he didn't look as bad as it was made out to be. And I feel like Cyril Ghan, he was terrified of the grappling that he didn't let any striking go. He's like trying to work a jab and move back. A couple steps back and you're against the cage. That's John Jones' territory. John Jones beat him so easily that this, to me, drops Francis Ngannou's stock. Francis Ngannou leaves the UFC to try to explore better, better ventures, and I'm the best in the world. He barely beat Cyril Gan. People thought he could have lost to Cyril Gan. John Jones taps him in two minutes. It was easy work for John Jones. That's the greatest fighter. That's the best fighter of all time, John Jones. Across all combat sports, boxing, MMA, kickboxing, I don't care. John Jones is the greatest combat sports fighter, period. And he proves it again and really puts the fucking stamp on it that that's the best ever. Mike Tyson, what do you say? I'm the most brutal and most ruthless and most vicious champion there's ever been. That's fucking John Jones, man. That's the great John Jones. It ain't Nganu. Nganu ain't no Alexander. John Jones is the Alexander. He's the great. And if Nganu, you know, maybe can somehow work his way back after losing a boxing match, I think John Jones bullies him on the floor too. He doesn't want that work. John's looks so good. Like, I, I know on the feet, you know, at first, like, when you first see it, maybe you think, oh, he's kind of off position. I went back, rewatched it. He actually looked solid. He knew exactly where he was at. And he was putting the pace on Gone. He touched him up with some low kicks. He didn't look like he was out of the fight in the stand-up at all. He was controlling where the fight was going. And Cyril Gone, he had him, you know, Cyril Gone's backing up. John Jones is plotting and walking him down. And as soon as he got a hold of him, it was easy. It was like taking candy from a baby. John Jones, by submission, Cyril Gon's ground game got exposed in this fight, but it also it's that John Jones is that fucking good. Yeah, I'm so happy John Jones won. I'm so happy. That was the lock of the week, John Jones, but fuck all the just lock of the week stuff. As far as being a guy who's followed John Jones from the Matt Hamill fight to now, it's tremendous to see this long reign of absolute dominance. And a motivated John Jones is terrifying. The heavyweight division's on notice. The Stipe fight's next. This is the best. Like, I know Nganu posted something, uh, you know, about Johnny Bones on Twitter. He said something to him. He talked a little smack. Of course he had to say a little something. You know how, how he had to fucking play it. Let me pull up Nganu's tweet. I got to look at it. Where did Nganu say? Good job, Johnny boy. Sincerely, the heavyweight king from Francis Nganu. Hey, listen, don't be tweeting at him if you ain't willing to fight him. I don't know. Maybe uh, somehow Nganu realizes he made a fucking mistake. Then the UFC cuts the offer of pay in half and he comes back and then John Jones beats him up. We'll see. It seems like Stipe Miocic, though, is definitely next. I love that fight. I think Stipe is more competitive than Cyril Gan will be because we know Stipe has wrestling skills. Cyril Gan does not. I still think John Jones takes him, too. John Jones, the best ever. Amazing performance for Cyril. He's got to get that grappling shit figured because now everybody's going to be shooting takedowns on him. They all want to get him to the floor. You saw it against Nganu, but damn, against Jones, exploited like nothing else. Suspect on the ground, Cyril Gan.
or is it just John Jones is that much of a fucking dominant force? I think a bit of both. All right, as far as the results for the card, I was 10 wins with four losses. I hit it. Lock of the week with John Jones. Let's fucking go. Lost with Valentina Shevchenko. Grasso, great win. One with Shavkat Rachmanov. Gets the submission. Perfect pick. I'm happy as hell about that. One with Mataj Gamrat. Thought it was decision. Obviously, very competitive fight and not overly impressive. One with submission for Bo Nickel. Hit it on the fucking head with him beating Jamie Pickett. Lost thinking Trevin Jones would sleep Cody Garbrandt. And damn, he got close in the third round, but he doesn't throw any shots. Good win for Cody. No love. One with Trekas Duplessis. Thought that there'd be a knockout in the second or third. He pulls it off and beats Derek Brunson by KO after Brunson starts well, but didn't finish well. And I mean, the corner threw in the towel. Brunson was dead. Good stoppage. Amanda Hibas, Viviani Arujo. I picked Arujo. She still had moments in the fight. She still had moments. She she tried for an arm bar late. Like, she had moments in this fight. But Hibas was clearly the better fighter. She won it. Bad pick on that one. Lost on that one. Lost with Julian. One round, Mark. Has good win for Mark andre Berrio. We won with Ian Machado Gary, but not with a little bit of nerves because he got dropped. Cameron Simon pulls it through in a fight that's foul-filled. But, hey, I'm happy Simon got that thing. That's a win. Tabitha Ritchie win. She looked better than I even thought against Jessica Penny. Basharat win. He looked at against uh, Blackshear, but still a clean win. And Loic Radzibov escapes a war with Esteban Rybovics and gets his UFC debut win, won that one. So yeah, like I said, 10 wins, 4 losses, pretty solid work on the uh, main card going 4-1. and one. Only one underdog won on the whole card, and it was Alexa Grasso. How crazy is that? Guys, I hope you enjoyed the week's worth of UFC content for UFC 285. Much love to everybody watching. Make sure you smash the like. If you're new to the channel, subscribe. Let me know what you think in the comments. And for all the naysayers doubting the Jones pick, should have never doubted me. And now, for the people that were with me on John Jones, we got to just celebrate. Like, I'm so happy because John Jones is so good for the sport of mixed martial arts. So good. Big events coming. I think he's fighting again this summer against Stipe. It's going to be epic. Thank you all for tuning in, and I will see you all in the next one. Peace, everyone.